five, four, three, two, one, and we're live. Hi everyone, today we're looking at Beethoven, Sonata number 30 in E major, opus 109, a moment I've been waiting for for a while. Uh, we're gonna look at this Friday as well, we'll look at the second movement, we'll look at the variations next Monday, and we might actually spend, uh, spend an extra session on the variations because there's a lot to look at. So, okay, I just wanna get this out of the way. I had many, um, scores of this piece with so much written in them and lost them in different ways. Uh, either one was stolen from, uh, from my car once. Uh, so I just want to get that out of the way and say that, but uh, I think it's time to move on and just write things fresh and new. So that's what I've started to do here. And you know, we're going to look at a lot of stuff in here. We're really going to look at, um, uh, really everything that we can. So, uh, hi to everyone who's joined. Hi, Graham. And let's start this, okay? I'm gonna play this for you once. I think I'll just move the score away. It's kind of weird to play half things half by heart, so I just put it over there for now. And here we go. This is the first movement. Uh, I remember the first time I heard this piece. I just fell in love with it. If you haven't heard it, I wouldn't be surprised if you fall in love with it too. So.
look at this amazing piece. Okay, so number 30, right? He wrote 32 sonatas, so we're kind of, you know, the end of, getting close to the end of Beethoven's life, and he's obviously a, a different kind of composer than the, than the one that wrote, you know, the, the, the Tempest sonata and, and, and all those other ones that came before it. Didn't really distinctively divide Beethoven's life into three periods. So there's something a bit more spiritual to this uh, later Beethoven, especially these last three sonatas, and you could probably add a, add a few others there. Hi, Harold. Uh, hi, Elizabeth. So let's start. Let's get into this. I think we could spend the whole session on just the first few bars. We won't do that. So we have the circular motion. And it's very passive. It's very peaceful. It's like, you know, kind of almost pastoral, you know, just... It's like uh, riding a bike in nature, or however you want to put it, you know? I suppose riding a bike is better than driving a car. Riding a horse, right? Taking a, taking a walk, let's say. Taking a walk, that's better than riding a horse. And then something happens, right? There's like some, some accident or, or surprise, let's say. Interruption. So there's a lot of ways that you can practice this to really get the right effect. And, and, and that can take a long time, you know? I mean, I think it took me years. So you can just be patient with yourself. Maybe you've already been working on this for years. So break it down like this. So you see we have, it starts with a pickup. I think some people miss that. They go, mm. a pickup, right? We only have this, the, the, yeah, the Sonata Crucis. So, and one, and one, two, one, two. So you can really, you know, feel that if you just put everything solid. And you can go like this, kind of like this. I'm not counting the meter here, but just the groupings. One, two, one, two, one, two. See how we have that? One, two, one, two, and then one, two, three, four. So we got that. Then there's the circular motion, right? I think there's a variety of ways of practicing this. You know, or I find that works very well. some problems I had this morning. So what else do we have here? The wheel, of course, the wheel technique. That's really important, right? So or at least, you know, I might bring this up a few times, Leon Fleischer. Um, this is on YouTube. I recommend everyone check that out. I, I might repeat a few things that he mentioned there, but uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a pianist, uh, Nimrod David Pfeffer or something like that. Just check it out. I'm sure you'll find it. And uh, I really love this pianist. Maybe I'm a little, a little biased towards liking him because, uh, you know, my, my principal teacher of that I had for 10 years was his assistant for, for many years. So he's kind of like a source of a lot of things that I've learned, but you know, I just love the way he talks about this. How do we get this surprise feeling kind of fresh after we've heard this so many times and we know it's coming? And one of the great ways to do that is 
Just practice it like this. Just go straight to B major, right? So that's a little funny. feel more spontaneous. Even if you've heard it so many times, right? So that, that really helps. Okay, any questions about this? Uh, just pop it in the chat, guys, and we'll, we'll spend more time on that opening. I feel like we could talk about it. Really, I mean, we could just talk about it the whole time. So, so let's go on. So we have that, you know, I was just re-listening to that master class and he also suggested to not slow down before that diminished seventh chord, which is a great way of not announcing it, you know, because you don't want to, we don't want to give it away. And we know it's coming, right? But, um, that's a bit more of a surprise. Okay, let's go on here. after the first beat. You don't think about it. You shape to the second half of the first. You see how we have that? That's really nice. So we have all that grouping and a lot of information here. Crescendo, fortes, pianos, slurs, and slurs with dots. So you can do those as well. These ones have dots, and these ones don't, these two here, and the dots again. Again, these two here, and then back to dots. somehow in D-sharp major. A very, very, very distant key from the E major that we just began. And when keys are like half a tone, if it's half a tone below our original key in a major key, it's really not much that D-sharp major has to do with E major. So he's gone at the very beginning of this piece really far away, right? Um, so here we have it. Uh, sorry. As Fleischer says, he goes in the black hole. thing to think of. And I think this uh, as well, this will be in the left hand. 
that's really important. Make sure we hear that. Really just incredible. This is kind of normal to our E major. Respect the silences in the left hand. One, two, three, four. One, two, four. I always thought those were thirty seconds. They aren't. And then we start again. That's the similar to and he'll come back at the end all right so three times we're gonna have this figuration so here's the second the second time and that kind of gets us in the the second part of this very unusual sonata form as you've noticed by now <laughs> it's really there's nothing conventional about the form in this sonata really from start to be to finish um, could we call this a recapitulation when this comes back? I'm not sure. Is that really a development that we're starting after? You know, this is very, um, is there, is that, is that a second theme, right? Do we have a second theme? He's, he's really messed up the convention. And then our second movement is a 6-8 prestissimo in E minor, right? So, are these beautiful, beautiful variations, uh, and we're going to talk about that next week. That's really the, the most amazing thing in this sonata, and uh, you know, someone suggested to me, I can't quite remember who, but it made sense, it just confirmed the way I felt about this, is the kind of, sometimes composers get a little philosophical, and, and they put a little key you know, some key to, to something, like a key to life, uh, early on in the piece. This is about an 18-minute piece, and I think we have that here in this first movement, this part that's coming up much later. like the key to the key to everything he wants to say is in those few bars so let's go to this sort of a, a second part here where we come back with so make sure this you really take the time to remember to sing the bass line If you can, if you can, right? So, when you really bring that out, think of it as a cello again. I'm going to say this many times, but I think this is a perfect example. And if you look at this, how do we shape that? Come back to the C sharp, A, G sharp. too much. She didn't write it and we have Dulce, right? So, and again, this is the pickup, and this is, right? So don't, don't switch the meter backwards, yeah? Keep, give us a sense. Help us, help us figure out where the meter is. Crescendoing with 
with every intention of getting right to the end. And then at the last chord, he takes it away. Right? sure you have a sense of something that's really continuing it's it doesn't really stop you know even though you might group things uh, in a certain way it's it just keeps on going on and on right there's that crescendo piano and here we start and again now sforzano piano gives it a, a little bit of effervescence, right? And then the next group, and then again. Now here, if you consider this really, uh, this is probably the maximum <laughs> range on Beethoven's piano. An A sharp up here, and uh, an E. So, uh, in the bass, it's probably about as far as his piano goes. He's really stretched it, and he really loves that, right? Uh, there's also a limit to how loud those pianos got. Although he didn't write fortissimo here, it just makes sense to widen it again at the end. <laughs> beauty of Beethoven, as, uh, as tempestuous as he can be, and as tempestuous as we think him to be, he has that ability to be so unbelievably tender at the same time. Maybe not at the same time, but, you know, often in a, in a bipolar way. So that's just, you know, this piece is full of that. I would say even more, more tenderful than tempestuous. The second movement is a little tempestuous, but um, not like uh, not like the appassionato sonata, you know, the F uh, F minor sonata. It's really different. And then in this third movement, we get the most some of the most tender sides of Beethoven in there. So you feel that here, this. So you kind of hold it up here, the sustain the forte, and then so that 
C natural, very important, that C natural there. All right, so here we go. No crescendo this time. Same thing, shape two here. Just start rewriting these things in here. All right. Follow the thumb in the right hand, the left hand a little bit. Then we have this crescendo. To one F. Okay, and a G major seven. Then we'll go to C major. Don't make too big of a deal of this G major because this when he repeats the C major, that's the that's the fortissimo where he wrote fortissimo. That's where we want to go all the way. And of course, never really reach the maximum. I think in any music, you know, even even list. There's no point of going all the way to the maximum. Always leave a little space, you know. You don't want to go in the red zone there. So here's our G major 7. Coming back to E major, right? So that's really special, right? Uh, by the way, I did another video of this, which was oh, it's still uh, it's still available for patrons, but these these things will eventually, since Patreon has changed a little bit, these things are going to become a I'll probably post that. Uh, on the YouTube, but there was, there was a video, I'm just thinking maybe I didn't upload that video, but there's some on this sonata, so you can always go look at that in case I explain it better. So here we have that, G major seven. Resolve the C major, and then repeat the C major. And look at that diminuendo there, we're with two Fs. way to do that sforzando is especially voice it mostly on the top you know the more you the more you you have this this gets thick it just doesn't sound very good so voice it especially on the top and we get that uh, so no doing this See how that's not very it's not very bright so That sounds better. This was pretty soft. And see, it's kind of amazing how he goes from C major back to E major. So that helps you. It helps you express this. He wrote espressivo there as well. So, Crescendo. Back to E major. Give it a nice swell here and then come back down. Another one from Fleischer is leave the pedal all the way to the C sharp. Justin. Um, right now, you know, I get I, I can give piano lessons to fairly beginners, although I usually don't teach them very often. So what I recommend is, if you're a beginner and you and you want lessons, uh, find a teacher who's going to teach you every week because it's it's kind, of, it's kind of important to have lessons every week, if not at least twice a month. Two, three, and then I'm always happy to give uh, one-time lessons, you know. So, but I have I, I have stopped teaching uh, beginners on a regular basis. Uh, that's for sure since a few years. Okay, so we came back to this beautiful uh, figuration like we had in the beginning.
incredibly um, innocent, beautiful, pure. Again, get your pickups. And the one, and the one. Da -dee, da -dee, da -da -dee. Follow the quarter notes. Did we say that in the beginning? Da -dee, da -dee, da -da. Even if you go, it's a little better to do that. Then in the bass there. Crescendo. So here's a, here's a good place to practice doing crescendos, <laughs> something that's seemingly impossible to do on piano. But again, if we find that alignment, we're going to go into this a little bit in this video. There's another video on this. It's on the channel, so you can you can watch that one too. Maybe maybe let's see. Will I explain it better? So these ones here, yes, okay. Once we find that alignment here, done. We've talked about this many times, right? Putting the fists like this, you could cycle the feet. It means you get the cycle your legs, it means you get the feet off the floor. Send the coccyx towards the back and push forward with the fists. This lengthens the spine and you kind of end up doing this, right? If you let go and that establishes this movement, right? That's connecting more of your body to the instrument, really from the sit bones and I would say even, you know, really the everything that's touching the bench there so you, it's like you're falling forward and you push yourself back a little bit right and you can get that that kind of sound it almost feels like we're doing crescendos on that and we're going to need to use the waist here use the use the lower body to shape this have to get the connection between really let's say the elbow and the hips that's really going to give you the ability to shape things from the waist from let's say the hips and the lower body right because otherwise this, you can do it with the arm it, it works quite well to start from here, then you get something like this. With the two hands, to, uh, see how the weight is kind of, I've shifted my weight to my left sit bone. And now to the center. So you see this here gets kind of connected to this movement. So we have ta -di -da -da. Um, party. That's the way to do it. Okay, it's a good passage to, you know, practice this. The idea is that the movement starts from the lower body. It's not the other way around. Otherwise, it's useless, whatever movement you do. This is on its own. Not even sure how to do that anymore but that's it so you know you can practice this sort of thing you know imagine your elbow and your hip bone is connected with some invisible wire and then you know do these movements like you would do probably in a Pilates class right going kind of around the two sit bones and then slouching in the back just to feel how this is connected you know the upper body is resting on the lower body so the movements you make from the lower body that can be the start of a movement. If you do sports, if you do martial arts, does anyone here do sports or martial arts? Let me know in the comments, I would love to know. Um, well, you already know this stuff very well, you know. Any movement that, that you do from, that's coming from uh, this center of energy, it's not just a center of energy, but it's a center of, of gravity, and so much is connected physically and anatomically 
to, to the center of your body. So the movements that start from there are much more powerful and much more connected. I'm sure anyone can uh, uh, confirm that who does karate, that the way you break a, a, a piece of wood with your arm is not, is not from the muscle. It's, it's the way you connect everything in your body and, of course, the intention. Tai Chi and Qigong, do you do that as well? Tai Chi and Qigong, Qigong that's great. Um, so, yeah, that's also very similar, Tai Chi and Qigong. I think maybe even in yoga, you probably do make a lot of movements start from the from the waist or, you know, the second chakra area. So that's that's really the idea here is to get the movements to start from there. All right, let's go on. I mean, we could just talk about this all morning. Uh, let's get a little more musical here. To body crescendo. And here I think a little bit. He didn't write it, but that's the sweet chord. So remember what I said earlier, it's as if the key to everything that the philosophical journey he's going to bring us on in the sonata, the key to life is, is hidden in these bars somehow, or the key to whatever he's trying to tell us. He just gives it to you right away. twice. You want a little more on this one. Did I do that? And this one less. So you have that, right? This is the first time he starts this figuration on the beat. So isn't that interesting? The beginning was two, one, two, two, one, two, one. And here we had, uh, oh no, here it was on the beat. Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, two, one, two, one, two, one. Same thing here. Two, one, two, one. Now he goes directly on it. One, two, one. of breath on that sforzando and here's one place where you know I learned to do these chords with 5-2-1 just to voice it a little better on the G sharp get the third so you can do that sort of thing instead of doing 5-3-1 5-2-1 it's not because it's more comfortable it's just easier to get the sound that you want right so, all right, we could almost just do that whole thing again. I'm sure we'll have more to talk about. So, who is playing this piece? Who is playing along? And I'm curious, whatever piece you're playing, just write that in the comments. If you have any other questions about this piece, you know, maybe it merits just to be played through one more time. We will look at the second movement on Friday. Uh, don't forget to like the video. If you like the video, click the like button. Uh, that helps other people find it as well, find these videos and, and uh, enjoy them as much as you do. So there's some good karma vibes there. And um, also check out the Patreon page. On the Patreon page, uh, lots of cool stuff going on there. Uh, if you become a patron, you can send me uh, videos of your playing, which I will critique for you. Uh, also get a free lesson after five months of being a patron. That's pretty cool. And do check out the schedule also to all the stuff that we're looking at because that's in the description as well. 521 works great. I'm preparing for a competition. Awesome. Which competition and what pieces are you, are you working on? Uh, do you live in Montreal, by the way? I think you do. I think you've said that a few times. Not so ready for this piece yet. Well, listen to anyone talk about Beethoven anytime. Awesome. I suppose it's a, it's a more advanced sonata, that's for sure. You know, it doesn't seem so hard, but I think to like, you know, understand the, uh, 
the, the there's a maturity required for it. So, you know, you could surprise yourself, but otherwise, you learn some learn some early sonatas and learn some middle sonatas as well. And then this could be a great start for a late sonata. Uh, I don't think it's harder than the A flat major or the uh, number 32, which is also amazing. So definitely look at that at some point. Yeah, there's something kind of accessible of this one. So here we go, guys. We did it. Beethoven. That's <laughs> not uh, Opus 109. And just for the fun of it, I'm going to play through that first movement one last time for you. If you have any last questions, then just throw them in the chat. And if not, then I will see you Friday. Let's try this thing again. like the 
second of the Pashana is beautiful, beautiful. Second pat the teeth. That's great. We should do pat the teeth on here as well. I think there's already a few videos on it. But that's so, 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 so beautiful, that A flat major. That's really incredible, you know? And, the, and one, one of the beautiful things in there. <laughs> side of Beethoven, I'm trying to say, also even in the first sonata, this is beautiful, beautiful uh, second movement, uh, his second movements are just unbelievable, the, the second movement of the fourth sonata as well, it's, just check that out, I think there's a recorder, a recording of Richter playing that, um, yeah, okay, back to the patatique, A flat, so he comes back to it,